Hello, Emerson College. My name is Amog Matthews. Amog, you can take your mask off now. You're good. All right, all right. I'm following you. If Jim Hoppy comes after me, it's Joe DeVitti's head. Not my problem. Just kidding. Joe DeVitti. Joe. <laughs> Joe. Just kidding. Joe DeVitti loves me intimately. And Jim. Anyway, hello, Emerson College. My name is Amog Matthews, and I welcome you to your newest source of comedic news, The Timeline. We're smart, funny, informed, and a diverse group of liberal arts students with a common trait of disappointed parents. We talked about our feelings last night and it was very helpful to me. Anyway, so before we go down the road of today's major stories, let's take a quick detour and take a look at these little things. That's right, you've all seen them, folks. Masks. In times such as these, misinformation spreads, spreads so fast, dare I say, like a virus. Moving on, jokes aside, over this past summer, while you were probably jerking off in your bed or crying about why you weren't on Emerson Misconnections, woohoo, and maybe streaming Tiger King on your twin bed, you probably saw a bunch of infographics discussing masks. And then you saw an infographic telling you how to make infographics, and then another on why that infographic tutorial infographic was wrong, and then maybe wondering why you care so passionately and deeply about infographics. I can get why mask infographics, I'm saying infographics a lot, may have fallen under the radar for you, so let's go over it again slowly. Now, I'm a medical professional, so I can say this as 100% fact, but for real though, N95s are technically the best masks and serve amazingly to help your COVID security needs. Only problem is that everyone knows this and they are costly and come in limited quantities. Makes sense. Thus, they don't get into the hands of people that really need them, healthcare officials. Now, this doesn't mean you get to wear your neck gaiters and bandanas everywhere, all right? I've seen you around. We all know you just crave attention or like guns. Anyway, the idea that anything is better than nothing is the right mentality when walking to the dining hall. But when it comes to masks, this just simply isn't the case. Many COVID officials even argue that it's worse. Yeah, that's right. It's worse than wearing no mask at all. That's right. Your insecurities is what's killing everybody around you. The fabric, though, I'll admit comfortable, is simply too thin for effective protection. Another one to stay away from are masks with filters built into them. Though alluring because they give off this idea of being like high tech, it is cool. It's apparently not true. These masks are, once again, recommended for a specific occupation, construction. When dust particles are an everyday threat to you, then special filtering is needed. In other words, if your job does not involve you wearing Tims, then why, would, why the fuck would you wear Tims? I mean, hell, you can get kicked out of American Airlines flight for wearing that kind of mask. And I hear they beat up pregnant women, so I don't know. I heard that. They're pretty ruthless over there. I don't know for sure. Anyway, now you might be perpetually thinking, Amog, Emerson just took 50 years worth of my lunch money. You're a medical professional. What masks are affordable and effective that I can put on my face and be safe from COVID? Thank you for asking, my friends. Reusable two-layered cotton masks. Yep, they're not only great for you, but they're good for Mother Earth as well. And they can be a creative declaration of what type of COVID grief you're experiencing. For example, my giraffe mask clearly shows that I'm clawing for a semblance of childhood joy and to, me to meet my estranged father. I'm actually not joking with that. I don't know my father. Anyway, uh, yours could be that you like coffee or something. There has never been a better time for creative personal expression. Uh, anyway, so cotton masks are popping up everywhere, from supreme masks to hand-sewn ones from your kind neighbor. If you can't get a reusable cotton mask, I'll buy you one. Come up to me in, in real life, and I'll buy you one. People around the world have found creative ways to uphold their social responsibility. For example, this Lady Gaga picture. She went the Mad Max route. You don't have to. Um, for poor people, you know, others have taken sewing uh, their masks from clothes, especially when the lines at Michael's is just too goddamn long. But goddamn if Michael's ain't my shit. Anyway, uh, oh damn, that's a nice ass. I mean, mask. <laughs> Very nice seamwork, needlework, impeccable. Always, masks are all about our social responsibility and responsibility to each other. Damn, that was a nice ass though. But anyway, as you know, wherever you go, pricks are everywhere. All right, so I'm in market basket and they're telling me I need a mask. And I'm not wearing a mask because I have medical issues that I can't wear a mask. Who's protection? If you're sick and you feel comfortable wearing a mask, you should wear one because this is a real fight because they're taking away our, our, our amendment rights, they're taking away our freedoms. I had to wait in line to come in the store, then they want me to put, put a mask like this, I'm healthy. I'd like to speak with your manager, Karen. 
I don't know what amendment they're ever even referencing. Amendment 28, is that your right to entitlement? No mask because I don't want to smell my oniony breath. Neither do we, Karen. Neither do we. Civil liberties nor the amendment are being tread upon. If anything, masks are an important step to health ensure the health of protesters. And I'll say it, counter protesters too. Even as they terrorize institutions like, like Planned Parenthood. Can't protest anything if you're fucking dead, Karen. Just ask the baby that was aborted. We're having fun, guys. I promise. <laughs> Anyways. I can get that, ma I get that masks aren't normal. I get they restrict the cares of the world from demeaning essential workers. Everyone's got to make sacrifices, you know? You're allowed to hate masks and still wear them. God knows I hate this thing. Come on, Karen, please take one for the team. Like the essential worker you just dehumanized, don't make them deal with you and your delusional Amendment 28. Entitlement is goddamn crazy. Anyway, lesson of the day, kids. Don't eat any onions when you wear a mask. This message was brought to you by Jim Hoppy, who also says a big fuck you to Emerson students who take their masks off and smoke. That's not from me, that's coming from Jim, not me. Y'all can smoke your lungs out, I don't give a fuck, blame Jim. Anyway, moving on, let's go on to our next topic. Little kids, little kids far and wide are struggling with in-person and Zoom classes. The one thing the president and I can agree upon, and Donald, if you're watching this, hey, what's up, is how learning on Zoom can be very difficult. Donald Trump's not watching this. Anyway, try learning about sex ed with your mom cutting bananas right, ne right next to you. Yes, mom, that is how you put a condom on. Mom, why do you know what a dental dam is? Mom, put the banana down. Mom, what are you doing? Anyway, my generation only had to worry about puberty and the occasional frog dissection. Uh, but this Zooming generation has to do with puberty, their parents who already don't understand them. And you know, it's tough, okay? It's not a phase, mom. It's tough being a kid. And teachers who don't know how to mute themselves, passing notes is long gone. Yep. Instead of students DMing each other through Zoom chat boxes for their teachers to read them later with some cheap Chardonnay. That's right, kids. Privacy died way before you were born. What's not dead? Insubordination. <laughs> a, lo a local Baltimore teacher is rounding up students who ditched his lesson on fractions. Damn. This parole officer and th this dude called their parents, apparently, their relatives, or anyone who might have had an idea where the students escaped to. Professors, I spoke to you several times. I know you get my emails, right? It took a few more calls. The student was found. Murray connected him to tech support. His, his name is on the list to get a device also. Murray does this every okay. week. Get um, the dad to give me the number, contact the mother, you know, and then call the student. So now we're sending a link to the student so he can get on and make sure that he's able to get on and, and deal with his, his classes. So you're That's like a private detective. We are like MacGyver. We're going to do whatever we have to do to try to get this student in class. We want to get these kids in class. Two plus two, he'll get you. Am I like Trevor Noah yet? Anyway, come on MacGyver, just send them to a breakout room. They can all bond in Zoom detention, and then they'll become the breakout club, where they'll just hit their jewels and pretend they're anime characters on Snap, and unknowingly give their information to China. I mean, use TikTok, sorry. Fun stuff. <laughs> anyway, MacGyver highlights the important pitfalls of online classes. While students don't want to attend his math class, STEM students simply can't. It's a major technical divide. If you haven't done Google, if you haven't done Zoom, if you haven't done Blackboard, and you're in an impoverished environment that resources are like little to none, then that is problematic. So no matter your age or how talented you are in making Zoom backgrounds, technology is making learning harder. It's not only making it difficult for students and teachers, but also for their families. Students spend 80% of their time in school. Now they're spending 80% of their time in front of their iPad, which not even a couple years ago would have shocked mommy blogs all over the world. Schools are essential for families because everyone's schedule revolves around little Tommy being in and out of the house from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. It's all fun and daycare until little Tommy becomes Big Timmy, and, and post-COVID schools have had to find alternative ways of maintaining the core social structure. Katie O'Connor showed the world how her class is changing to accommodate this new learning environment. I am on the mission of social distancing my classroom. And so I have to remove all personal items from my classroom. I have to set up my um, desks so that they're all three feet apart. So she has these type of desks. This is just what she had. They used to be in little pods. They all circle up nicely. So we still have to figure out how to get these to be three feet apart. Parents who don't want their child to social distance a mere three feet are taking them out of school and enrolling them into online classes. They've always said a boy's best friend is his mother. 
but in Zoom, a boy's best friend is his mother and his webcam. Unfortunately, building new relationships on Zoom is an eternal icebreaker activity. Another idea is the pods, not a sequel to the invasion of the body snatchers. Rather, students are put into specific small groups and are taught all of the subjects by one teacher. One pod does not fit all sizes though. Wealthy families are hiring teachers to educate their child and a select few of their bougie friends. However, these pods often exclude low income families due to the high cost. They can cost up to $100 per hour. Screw that shit. That's bullshit. Not everyone can hire their own goddamn Miss Frizzle, especially if Miss Frizzle is be selling her ass for $100 an hour. Education is becoming way more privatized, and on Miss Frizzle, it's a bad look. Anyway, let's be real. The only good thing about private schools is the name recognition and bloated budgets for scratch uniforms. And that's pushing it. The debate about whether private schools are better than public schools is classist. A recent analysis of over 40 countries that participated in the OECD's 2012 Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA, concluded that public schools outperform both publicly subsidized private schools as well as independent schools in a majority of countries. Public schools make up 90% of the education system but don't receive the proper funding they need. In March, the federal coronavirus relief package gave K-12 schools $13.5 billion but our super qualified education secretary, Betsy DeVos, love her, uh, made it so that the money needs to be shared with private schools. I don't love her, I'm joking. That's like saying, hey, poor kid, give your shirt to Richie Rich, who just bought a men's warehouse. Someone, yeah, I know someone who said that to me. It was a tough day. Anyway, according to the New York Times, an average district with 3,700 students and eight buildings would need to spend an additional 1.8 million on health and safety measures. In private schools, it's COVID-19, but in public schools, it's just Rona. Furthermore, in public schools, most of the burden is being put on the teachers. Teachers are taking an, an additional task to compensate the decreased staff on campus. Since our teachers are being treated like babysitters, we might as well pay them like one. From now on, instead of, under, instead of an underpaid salary, they'll be given $12 an hour and a buy one, get one free pass of Chuck E. Cheese pizza. That's actually not that bad. Uh, moreover, both students and teachers are prohibited from leaving their classrooms and taking off their masks. Ooh, that's, that's eight hours with the same people, the same smells. What if someone farts? You, you, can't, you can't send them out, you know? Uh, students and teachers are finding alternative ways to learn. Arizona State University Prep Digital is an online public charter school run by Tempe where they've seen an increase of 700% in enrollment from 600 full-time students in 2019 to around 4,500 students just this year. Public education in the U.S. has always been a staple of society, but in other countries such as India and Chile, they, re they rely on low-cost private schools to educate their children. During the, early years of ch during the early childhood years, the future of education is super clouded right now. But if the U.S. doesn't get their crap together, we can see an even steeper education gap between the next generation, unfortunately. And now, let's move on to COVID's effects on colleges. And no, not Emerson, real colleges. Ooh, radical opinion. Like the soon-to-be Tesla University, where if you're pursuing an art degree, you'll be given a pair of Doc Martens along with your spacesuit during your life-changing spring semester abroad on Mars. We salute you, Headmaster, Headmaster Musk. I actually hate that guy. It's no secret that college has been getting more expensive. In fact, I'd rather say it's pretty common knowledge. Though the College Board reports that the real average net tuition post-aid is something around $14,000. I don't even, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, you can't dismiss the economic detractors schools have always had to face. And this is where coronavirus plays its part in hurting higher education economics. Now, I'm an economics professional, so I can say this as a complete fact. For instance, let's break down tiers of schools. We have our top tier schools, right? The Wagyu beef, if you will. The elites of the elites. I'm talking about them Ivy Leagues and them highly recognizable private institutions like NYU and John, Hop and John Hopkins. To put it simply, that cousin you don't like, they, they go there. For me, it's fucking Rohan. And I'm sorry. I don't want to wear an ascot like Cousin Rohan does. He actually does that. There's an Indian boy wearing a fucking ascot in a school. Anyway, it just doesn't look good on me, you know? Sorry, Mom. It doesn't look good on me. Ascots don't. But I digress. <laughs> um, during the financial strains of COVID, these schools will be safe. Rohan, despite my secret voodoo doll I have of you, he will be fine. Tier 2 schools, on the other hand, are going to suffer the real pain. 
These selective liberal arts schools like Middlebury and Vassar offer all the perks of, of higher tier schools, schooling while providing a more intimate, smaller education for a slightly smaller or comparable price, like a filet mignon. But this comes with its own set of issues. NYU business professor and full-time suspicious egg Scott Galloway went as far as to compare them to department stores. See, the top tier schools go into their waiting list. They'll be fine. They'll clear the waiting list. There's never been a better time to be on a waiting list of a tier one school, which will force the tier two schools to go much deeper into their waiting list. If 20 or 30 percent of the students don't show up, which the surveys say they are planning not to do in fall, we could see 20 to 40 percent of universities start a death march similar to what department stores have done. Second tier universities are to education what department stores are to retail, and that is they are about to begin a death march. You know, and it makes sense from an economic point of view, but until I see Lee Pelton on Thanksgiving Day uh, with a float with a 3,000 foot inflatable grift the lion, I will never think of Emerson College as a department store. As you can see, that is not the only comparison Galloway was trying to make. The real comparison lies with the in, within the inflation and the 08 recession. Take Marshalls, for example. Besides being the premier spot for dads getting shitty socks and undershirts, they've been surprisingly been falling wayside over the years. For a time, department stores were of great value. You were getting similar good products for cheaper. Once a customer base was built, people continued to flock, but prices were raised. At a certain point, people began to realize they were paying the same or more for less. In the 08 recession, where everyone pretty much lost money, didn't help things either. Galloway sees a similar downward trajectory in colleges, but also sees this trend being worsened by COVID to a very dangerous point. Well, we have raised tuition rates 1,400% in the last 40 years. You know, we have raised, when I say we, I mean the academic community, we've raised prices faster than healthcare. And at the same time, the underlying innovation, if you walked into a class today, it wouldn't look, smell, or feel much different than it did 40 years ago. So I think we've kind of stuck out the mother of all chins in the fist of COVID-19 is coming for us. I think this involves huge disruption, and I think it starts this fall. Uh, COVID-19 is more of an accelerant than a change agent. During the 08 recession, less kids were being born. Makes sense. Mommy and daddy didn't really want to get it on. You know, when they realized their stocks in MySpace were tanking, who wants to have sex then? And that the only form of Viagra was a few Dow points on Facebook, which was fairly hard to get. Anyway, to add on to that, many families are still reeling from the recession. And this means two things. In the mid-late 2020s, Kids who were born in the late 2000s will be heading off to colleges in smaller numbers and less money to offer up front. Those elite tier ones will be saved by Rohan's endowment, of course, and state schools will be assisted in some way by the government. What's left is a drug rug wearing tier two friends. With smaller endowments giving less of a net, colleges in this tier need to start making some big plans to continue to have a steady income, especially from new kids. Pretty easy, let's just hope a pandemic doesn't ruin that. Hold on, you guessed it, and I made it obvious, it already has. Back in May, Galloway predicted that somewhere, somewhere between 20 to 30% of students were going to opt out of returning to college this semester. Galloway continued to say that if, an, that if that number came to fruition, this could cause 30 to 40% of schools with bad endowments and no outside help to start their path to financial ruin earlier than later. It's like that meme of people dancing and holding a coffin but instead of a metaphor about death of the Travis Scott burger or the Kardashians, oh geez, that's very sad. It's one of America's most valued economic resources. In fact, we are already seeing plenty of schools begin to close early, the canaries in the coal mine. Schools such as McMurray, Urbana, and Holy Family College are already voting to shut down operations as they foresee the economic decline happening sooner than later. What comes from this is that thousands of students who need to transfer and faculty members becoming unemployed. This has been brewing for a while now too. Apparently in a recent book about the, the college stress test, academics state, stated that 10% of schools are going to face severe market risk with COVID bumping that number to 20%. This is a major problem, folks. Emerson cannot buy every liberal arts school that goes out of business. It's also fair to mention that most of these schools are liberal arts oriented. A professor at the University of Pennsylvania's graduate school, Robert Zemsky, claims that 20% of America's private liberal arts colleges are on the cusp of financial catastrophe. Over 200 liberal arts colleges are at serious risk of shutting down, so there will be even less places to go in a debt while earning a degree that will make you no money. Maybe America could benefit from forcing kids to, get a, to earn a degree that actually means something 
So, so as liberal arts colleges are beginning to die out, let's take a solemn moment and remember all the arts kids we will so dearly miss. What, make, what makes this more of an academic issue is when you bring up the idea of college towns. A lot of small towns in close proximity to colleges make a bulk of their money from students. Bro, you tripping if you think local economies of these college towns can last. And while I understand that there are benefits to less kids being around town, for instance, my grandma ain't got to listen to Mobamba eight times a week from the frat house next door, I do also understand that the survivability of her favorite restaurant bookstore, favorite supermarket, is less likely without kids not being around. This can be seen beyond a local level as well. Take college sports, for example. The NCAA notes that the money made from a college's athletic system typically makes up half of the institution's budget. Without the stable source of money through things like promotions and ticket sales, many universities are struggling to stay afloat in the wake of COVID. Student athletes are also affected as there are now much less opportunities for athletic scholarships. Some of these kids rely on these opportunities to get higher education. Losing major sports like football also has detrimental effect on small, on small college towns. Communities like Knoxville, Tennessee rely on the University of Tennessee's football fans to not only come to their games, but stay in their hotels, eat at their local restaurants, and spend money at their stores. Towns like this will see a massive decrease in tourism, hurting their local economies. And this is especially upsetting when you realize these towns are in the middle of nowhere. I hear you can only go cow tipping like twice a week before it gets old. That being said, if any of you guys watching this has actually been cow tipping, it is very much an activity that I could see myself getting into. Um, so please hit me up. I really want to do it. Anyway, now let's focus back in and now let's bring it back to Boston and let's talk about Emerson students' favorite topic of conversation, themselves, yourself, you. Students at Emerson, including me, have had to adjust to these unprecedented times, according to Jim Hoppy. Sidebar, what times are precedented? Nothing that happens has ever happened before. That's how time works. The past is garbage. History's propaganda. I'm right. Don't correct me. Go fuck yourself. End of sidebar. Now, while Emerson may look quite different this year, I'd like to argue perhaps uh, for Emerson students, not much has changed. Stay with me now. Let's start with one of the biggest college expectations, partying. As I've heard from many anonymous sources who continue to remain unnamed, and that's definitely not me, college is chock full of underage drinking, house parties, blacking out, and general roof raising. College is so full of these partying uh, that even a viral business capitalizing on binge drinking called I'm Schmacked ran from the late 2011 to 2019. Unfortunately, due to COVID and social distancing, partying at major universities has dwindled significantly. Emerson has no doubt suffered similar losses. Party, parties, as one student from previous year put it, don't exist at Emerson. The scene is a real disappointment with no attractive guys. In fairness, that review was written before I went here. Anyways, one student who had too much time on their hands, which is a lot of students at Emerson, let's be honest, uh, do not go here. Uh, do, said, do not go here. You want a fun college experience? Do not go here. Is this all true? Maybe, definitely it is. But hey, look on the bright side. You can't miss out on what you never had. I just want to let that sink in for some people. You can't miss out on what you never had. Anyway, and there is no lower, lower place to go than rock bottom. Just so you know, cool Emerson students, five people in a dorm room with two beers to share doesn't count as a party. Trust me, I know a couple of frat brothers at MIT. If there's no Coke, what are you doing? I love Coke. Next up on the list of college expectations, big sports games. The excitement, the fans, the drunk students, the band kids getting recognition, face paint, parents reliving their glory days, it's all there. Or at least it was. Again, due to the global pandemic, sports are not really happening at the scale that they once did. Now many people look, look at Emerson and say, Psh, they don't have any D1 sports. They're not even that good. Eh, wrong answer. We're D1, but in eSports. That's right. I did not know this either. This is new information to me too. Make sure you write it down for bragging rights for your high school friends back home. It is surprising that Emerson has sports teams and athletes that go along with them. Nifty trick for spotting an Emerson student athlete. They only look a little less disappointed to be here than the NYU film rejects. That line cuts way too deep. Sorry about that. You can find them at the gym aggressively lifting and dropping weights or throwing medicine balls at the wall. 
I'm not making fun of our student athletes. I'm sure the cancellation of their sports season was terribly hard on them. One of my best friends plays lacrosse. What's up, Jackie Poo, if you're watching this, hey. Um, as athletic director Patricia Nicole put it in the Berkeley Beacon, it was a sobering conversation, but the community affirmed it was the right decision to make, and those are pretty strong words coming from a coach when this is their passion and this is their livelihood. The tragic announcement of canceling the fall season came on July 14th. Coincidentally, the same day 90% of Emerson students found out we had sports teams. Besides Quidditch. Everyone knows Quidditch. Quidditch is the best. Uh, just to prove my point, show of hands in the studio, who has gone to an Emerson sporting event? No one raised their hands. Like I said, you can't miss what you never had. Continuing to run down my list of Emerson expectations, next up we have living in shitty dorms, which in an unexpected twist, Emerson has upended. In order to be safe and de-densify living spaces, whatever, whatever the freak that means, um, the college is currently housing over 200 students in the W, at least according to what's left of the Berkeley Beacon. Ooh, ah, that bird. Anyway, so I actually live in the W, and I'll be honest, it's pretty great. I never knew much about hotels to begin with, and it's a personal thing I'd rather not share right here. Uh, but neither did the guy helping me write this. So we put our heads together, six feet apart, of course. That's right, Jim. Um, he's not here. I wish he was here. Um, and agreed that if a place or a brand or a thing starts with the word the, it's fancy. And the theory held up for the W. So I actually asked my neighbors to see if they agree with me, and it turned out they actually had a way better room than I had. They had like a king bed, a bath, a mini bar and stools. You know what I have? Only a queen, only a stand in marble shower, and a little measly upscale desk. It, you know, you know what? It, it sucks because I feel like God always gives everybody else so much and just me so little. Anyway, it's okay. I'm used to it, I guess. Um, anyways, we also get our bathroom cleans like twice a week by the hotel staff, bedding's provided. Um, there's one elevator, so everyone's kind of late to class. And like most things in life, it fails you when you need it the most. But that's life, you know? Um, and while I am a conceited asshole, it really does feel like the height of luxury. But also, before I move on, there's literally like six washing machines for 200 people. I'm totally not above complaining about it at all. It sucks. I personally deserve so much better. And I don't know about the other 199 people. I'm sure they're fine, I guess. But I would like clean clothes, and I would like clean clothes now. Overall. I'd say Emerson has proved their living setup for students uh, this year, but if the dorm building is infested with rats, is it really an Emerson building? I'll leave that up to you, the folks watching at home. <laughs> Bottom line, who are we to complain that we missed out on anything because of COVID? Sure, we have to get tested weekly, but who doesn't like the little thrills of sticking things in your body? It adds a little danger to my life, something that I've been missing ever since I almost got hit by the above ground green line by Packard's Corner. A little Boston uh, discourse for you. Anyway. So Emerson students, stop complaining. Going from bad to worse isn't as bad as going from good to bad. <laughs> and you definitely don't need, and you definitely don't have as bad as me. So gimme, gimme, gimme. Anyway, now it's very easy for us to talk about the effects of COVID on college students, but little do we ever acknowledge the teachers themselves. They have their own concerns, they're their own people, they have their own misgivings about reopening schools as well. And our very own correspondent, Ryan Farrell, reached out to someone and talked to Jessica Tang, the president of the Boston Teachers Union, about those issues and, about, and what's really on the mind of America's educators. I'm Jessica Tang. I'm the president of the Boston Teachers Union. So um, thank you so much for being here uh, today. It's really great uh, to have you. Um, I guess my first question is, what is the role of a teachers union and how has that changed during the pandemic? Sure. So we have many roles. I mean, for sure, we are concerned about teaching and instruction and academics, uh, but our role expands so much beyond just the academic aspect of, of schools. So we are involved in everything right now from helping students get connected to technology, computers, Wi-Fi, tech support, um, helping with assistance with housing, food, insecurity, and uh, all of the wraparound services that schools generally provide even without a pandemic, um, which is that now we're trying to do it all remotely. And on top of that, <laughs> we've also learned how to become experts in air quality and ventilation and 
uh, facilities and maintenance. Um, and so I would say that our roles right now are pretty expansive because we are trying so hard to ensure that ultimately our schools are ready, um, both instructionally and physically, and that we have safe environments for educators and our students and uh, connecting our families to everything that they need to support their students to be able to learn in first place. What has been, I guess, as far as, as, as it's going so far, how, what's been the biggest challenge for teachers right now during the pandemic? Wow. So there are several, but one is that, you know, teachers are also parents. And so a lot of our teachers are really struggling to not only be there for their 20 plus students and their screens, but also their own children who also are, they have to be supervising and, and working with too. And, you know, that's a challenge that everyone has, I think right now, especially predominantly women who are expected to do both their work and the childcare and so much of the, uh, um, I forget what it's called, but like the unpaid work that women are expected to do. Yeah. Right. And so I think that's certainly a challenge. Uh, but in terms of concerns about the start of school, um, it has been totally learning how to teach completely differently in a way that we've never been trained to teach before, um, using platforms and technology and apps that we've never had to use before and we're learning how to use overnight. Uh, it's definitely also the anxiety and fear of the unknown and just constantly feeling like you're in limbo because this is all completely unprecedented. What, um, do, do you think that the, the fact that school is starting later um, will impact students' ability to learn? Well, actually, I think it was necessary because, again, we needed professional development time. We needed teachers to be able to be able to learn the skills and the technology and the best practices from the spring. Uh, so in the spring, it was pretty consistent because, you know, some some teachers are more technologically adept and are, um, you know, the folks who are the early adapters of any new skill. And then others, you know, who are excellent veteran teachers may struggle a little bit more with the technology piece and have a steeper learning curve. And so we really needed that time at the beginning of the school year to ensure that we had high quality remote instruction, uh, that there had to be training time, everything from learning about um, not just the platforms we're using, like Seesaw, Zoom, Google Classroom, et cetera, um, but also health and safety protocols, also um, co-teaching and planning and how you do the best practices of instruction remotely. I, it's a lot to think about and a lot to plan. And so I know actually a lot of folks need more time to continue planning, but um, if we had started earlier without that time to plan, I actually think we would have lost time because it what we kept saying is it's better to have a delayed start than a disastrous start because if you have a disastrous start then it takes all this time to fix what went wrong whereas if you delay it so that you have better plans in place then you're going to have a smoother start and a smoother transition and so that's what we've been advocating for how is the school year going so far well i think a lot better than the spring so we've heard really high attendance and actually our attendance is comparable to what it would be in person right now and uh, the feedback I've been getting is certainly people are, I think, generally more, much more impressed with what teachers have been able to do with some planning and time <laughs> to prepare uh, than in the spring. Um, and if anything, they're saying it's too much screen time and too much work that kids are get, being given. Um, but I think that overall, the remote learning has gone relatively well, except we still are looking for students who are missing. So that either haven't signed on because or we haven't heard from them, don't know if, you know, it's a matter of changed phone numbers or they are in a different housing situation um, and we can't reach them and ensure that they have what they need to sign on. So that certainly continues to be a challenge. Uh, but in terms of the vast majority of remote learning classrooms, it's been off to a pretty good start. The challenge is going to be when the hybrid in person starts on Thursday. And there's a lot of apprehension, anxiety, and concerns about how that's going to go. So I do not anticipate that's going to go particularly smoothly at the mm -hmm. as of now. Um, I mean, we still have today and tomorrow to prepare, but uh, from what I understand from on the ground, not every school is ready yet. 
Um, and so that's certainly going to be an issue, but generally speaking, again, you know, teachers rise to the occasion and I can't tell you how hard teachers are working right now through the weekends at nights, early mornings, all day, just to try to get everything done. And what I worry about is sustainability and how long they can keep this up um, before they burn out. Um, and so, yeah, you'll, you'll, you won't meet a more, I mean, I, I truly, you know, as a teacher's union president, I, I work my butt off too, but I work my butt off because I know that all of our teachers are. That's awesome. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for being here. Um, we appreciate your time very, very much. No problem. Thanks, Ryan. I'm your mediocre host of the Timeline, Amog Matthews. From all of us at the Timeline, please wash your hands, wear a mask if your rights don't matter to you, and stop trying to sneak your Tinder hookups to the dorms, you naughty little kids. Go get them, champs. This is a comedy show. Please don't take whatever I say too seriously. Have a good night, Boston.